Good morning to you all. So glad that you're here. I'm Ben. I'm the lead pastor here at Watermark, and uh, I'm so glad that you've decided to visit today or, or continue coming through as we're on this uh, semi-new teaching series. Before I jump into it, um, today is a Q&A um, Sunday, so it, there's a link that you can use to submit your questions at the end of the message. And we have a value as a church to build God conversations, not just all proclamation, but conversation. And so those questions online are totally anonymous, but you can raise your hand, and we'd love to hear your voice as you break the ice for your question that might be on your heart. And then Bucky and I, you know, we won't be perfect in our answers, but we'll try and model what it is to, to have a conversation. So, but for now, we're in this, this series, um, True Grit. I'm going to go back to that one for now. And uh, we just feels like we're in a day and age where we need some toughness, you know, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all three, not just uh, this exterior machismo thing, but like mind, body, and soul. And I'm so thankful that my, my, my first kind of vocational track record um, for my wife and I was kind of short-term missionary work. And we got to go on a couple trips when we were newly married. The second trip ever was to a small island nation off the coast of India called Sri Lanka. And in that place, my wife and I were really kind of uh, administrative assistants to a father-son combo. The dad, Adrian, ran a church, and the son, Prashan, ran a nonprofit youth movement for peace and reconciliation. If you're not familiar with the, the small island nation, I'll tell you, uh, one of their claims to fame was a tragic and, and decades-long civil war. You know, many people think that suicide bombing came from the Middle East. It originated in Sri Lanka. Tragic, tragic, um, just blood-ridden feud between brother and sister. You know, the same nation. It was a civil war. So sad. But we were so thankful to, to, to work under Prashan's leadership because we saw a man who was convinced, so convinced that if we don't heal and learn from history, we will be doomed to repeat it. And he just thought the best mechanism in the world to make sure we didn't repeat it was getting the hearts and the minds of youth. Imagine that. Getting the hearts and minds of the next generation for they will lead us into the future, won't they? And so I think that's really apropos for what we just heard from Joe and even the times that we're living in, you can apply that where you might. Anyways, I'll never forget what Adrian told us one weekend ahead of a Sunday service. We might have been there two weeks at this time. And we were starting to get the lay of the land for this congregation, very rural community. People there were agrarian farmers, homeless, transitional homeless. And I'll never forget, he said, Ben, you know, Riley, uh, if I don't give them something they can use in a seven-day period, why even get up and do church at all? I thought, wow, that's a different level of practical gospel instruction, isn't it? And I'm so thankful for our time overseas because it's um, rough. And it really challenges you, especially someone who was born and raised in Orange County. Not just U.S., not just California, but born and raised in Orange County. Like, man, I, I am soft. If anyone ever was soft... It's me, this Orange County boy who was born and raised in the so-called bubble of the OC. And I wonder if you can relate to that, wherever you were born and raised. I mean, this is the 1%, guys. Even being an American Christian, like I want you to challenge yourself with that question. How have I become a little soft in my mind, body, and soul? And there's all kinds of litmus tests you can do. Like, man, if they got my, my coffee order wrong, I'm ready to fly off the rails. Or, dude, if there's traffic today, if there's 20 minutes added to my commute, I'm flying off the rails. Man, if someone said an offensive thing to me, I'm pulling the Job card, you know, like I'm the suffering servant of God. Like, why owe me God just because someone gave a tough word to me? We can, all, we can laugh. It's okay to laugh. But we, but we laugh because we can relate. And so when the world goes haywire with global pandemic and global wars, like, guys, the Christians need to be the deeply rooted, gritty ones in the room. We say, nah, yes, we see you. But we just say, we actually have a reference for this. Jesus would say in Luke 21, there's going to be wars and threats of wars. There's going to be epidemics. Luke 21 says that. But the sign that you should look for is, is the Son of Man coming on the clouds with fire. <laughs> it's crazy. But that's what the Christian kind of soldier 
knows how to do. And that's what's spoken about here in 2 Timothy. True Grid is an expository series. It means line by line through a, through a book of the Bible. And we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2 today. And I'm going to read this from chapter 2. It says, from Paul to Timothy, working in the church of Ephesus. He says, so you, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And entrust what you heard me say in the presence of many others as witnesses to faithful people who will be competent to teach others as well. Take your share of suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one in military service gets entangled in matters of everyday life. Otherwise, he will not please the one who recruited him. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he will not be crowned as the winner unless he competes according to the rules. The farmer who works hard ought to have the first share of the crops. Think about what I'm saying, and the Lord will give you understanding of all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, such as my gospel, for which I suffer hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal. But God's message is not imprisoned. So I endure all things for the sake of those chosen by God, that they too may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus and its eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy, and there's this lovely poem he ends with. If we died with him, we will live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, since he cannot deny himself. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for these tough, startling, challenging words from the letter to Timothy. A son, a spiritual son in the faith. God, we are all spiritual sons and daughters now, striving to run the race and win the race. We're striving to not get entangled in these everyday affairs, Lord. And we want to be the constant gardener who just patiently, lovingly plods along through every season. Give us that help to achieve those things that only your Holy Spirit can aid us in. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's start in verse 3. Take your share of suffering. It's kind of like, take it. <laughs> Don't you get that tone? Like, take your medicine. And what is that medicine? Suffering. There's this Greek word I want you to repeat after me. Sunkakapathio. Go ahead. Sunkakapathio. Just go ahead and say it. Sunkakapathio. Yeah, I know. Some of you are very brave in the front row. Well done. Really the longest Greek word I've ever seen so far in my study of the New Testament Bible. And this word is really like several words packed in one. Got a conjunction there. There's a prefix that means with another. The short version is to suffer with another, to share in suffering. You know, we thought about Sunkakapathio as the title for this teaching series, but we thought uh, true grit might be more easy to manage. We landed on true grit. The long form definition to bear evil treatment alongside another. That's the call. Bear evil treatment alongside another. In this world, we are not promised the absence of evil. We are not promised the absence of evil. But we do have a promise we can make amongst ourselves in the body of Christ to suffer with each other, which just makes that load of evil a little bit more easy to bear. He's talking about in this first picture a soldier. And he says, put away, put aside civilian life. For the life of what? The life of warfare. So Timothy to Paul to Timothy, and now Paul to all of us. If we read ourselves into the text and say we are also soldiers, we put aside a civilian life, and we and for what, guys? What are we trading it for? Life of warfare. And I think it's a needed exercise for us to do that, to put ourselves in the context of. Soldier warfare. And maybe when we wake up and we're still in quote unquote Babylon and the enemy still has some power as the ruler of the air, the Bible says, to, to you know, influence, to tempt, um, to try and look for little holes in the wall to get, our, get, to get at us and, and do all, all that activity. But we're still, when we wake up in that kind of era, might it help us to remember this is warfare, not civilian life. When we wake up with the mistake of thinking, oh, this is going to be another suburban day in America, we've we've deceived our own selves, you guys. That's not the expectation. That's not the starting place. We don't wake up in suburban life. We wake up in warfare. But we are not without hope. Hang on. Goes to the next picture, this picture of the athlete. 
right? And he's crowned. The athlete is crowned. And, and you may think, boy, this is perfect because it's Greco-Roman culture. And so he's talking about the athlete in the arena who has this, this kind of this, this, lore, this wreath of, of leaves. And we say, man, that's great. Where's the competitive language? And how do we get, sharpen our bodies and our minds to, to run the race? And I say, amen, that's great. By the way, he says, by the law. That's one of the ways that we get sharp. Today, we just translate law as the word of God, okay? Anytime you see law in the New Testament, just put the, the, the word of God. It's helping us run. It's helping us sharpen our mind, bodies, and souls. But, but, but what is this laurel wreath? I went into the study and I just thought, okay, well, the word for crowned is used elsewhere and it's used like in places like Hebrews 2.9. We see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because why? Because he suffered death. That by God's grace, he would experience death on behalf of everyone. The winner's wreath for you and I is always a wreath of suffering. <laughs> of persecution. And you read Paul and he says, run the race and I'm running the race. I'm trying to finish well that I might achieve the prize. That is the prize. <laughs> and again, if we just flipped our mindset, some of us have this fixed mindset like, man, why? I, I joked in first service like about having young children. <laughs> and we think like, well, why, oh God, me? <laughs> like, why did you choose me for these sleepless nights and these cranky tantrums and these, and now if you don't have kids, these coworkers and these bosses that are overlords and this family system that's so backwards and like, why, oh God, me? Have you placed me in this, this season of suffering? And, and, and then we just, we're able to read Paul and he says, oh, that I might achieve the prize. Suffering is not just this, this, truck stop on the way to victory. It is the victory. The prize is the suffering. And in American Christianity, we are taught and we embrace that circumvention of suffering is the gospel. Guys, it's the antithesis of the gospel. All the while, circumventing suffering and hard things, we arrive at our huge crucible moment. The dragon is there and he's blocking the way because of our fear, our anxiety, our worry. On the other side of that big scary monster is what? The prize. The prize. And when we have circumvented that training in the everyday conflicts and battles, when the big one comes, we just say, what? I wish I would have known. I'm so shocked. And we just got to get back and say, oh, wait, 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 wait. The everyday suffering and trial and circumstance is the training ground for when that big, huge wave of that crushing defeat may come, which it inevitably will. This is why I say so consistently on Sunday mornings, we have to have a robust theology of pain and suffering in the church. Emotionally, physically, when injury or, 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 or disease comes for us, when emotional trauma and mental anguish comes for us, that's the prize. That's the outcome. It's like, that's the destination, not a pit stop, the destination. And we do this together. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, we do this together. Daryl Johnson, the great uh, expositor of the book of Revelation, says, he, Jesus, reigns. How does he reign with the, with the reward? By giving himself away for sinners. He reigns by suffering for and with sinners. That's you and me, by the way. And we reign with him by suffering for and with sinners. You realize that every act of servanthood, every choice to suffer with and for others is an act of reigning with the reigning lamb. Daryl's most famous quote from this great book is that things are not what they seem. And I would encourage you with that today. When you're in suffering, when you're in trial, when tough things happen, when you're freaking out because of the news and social media, remember, things are not as they seem. The enemy does not have us caught on one foot, tilting and teetering on collapse. No, he's reigning, and we reign with him every time that we suffer. Let's look at the farmer who works hard. And, um, you know, my father-in-law, Bucky, who is one of our pastors here, if you don't know him, uh, came into the office last week when I was studying. He said, the farmer, man, like, don't you get it? Like, that's the picture for you as a young parent. <laughs> Like, it means patience. It means patience, man. You know? Like, keep sowing those seeds. And I was like, dude, that's really good. Thank you. And I was like, I need to hear that today. <laughs> really, really good. 
or the kids are not, but just let that word be spoken to you. That's the, that's the farmer, the long sufferer. So you're planting seeds, you're watering them, you're tilling the soil, whatever season you're in, you, gotta, you, you just keep at it. The word here for farmer is a vine dresser. It's used many times in the New Testament, vine dresser. And, and, and you wouldn't, if you just got farmer, you could say patience and then move on, but that's not all. The, 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 it's the, the verb that, that qualifies the word farmer, and it's the words works hard. Works hard is this other wonderful Greek phrase, and, and I'll read you the, the actual full dictionary entry for this Greek word. To grow weary in toil, exhausting labor, worn out, depleted in body and mind. That's the constant gardener. <laughs> have this neighbor who, who lives on the main street that you have to pass every day when you come and go and I just know his face because he's out there all the time working on his, his front lawn, you know? It's looking great. He's really labored, man. I mean, like there was a dead plot, just <laughs> he could pray all the supernatural prayers he wanted. That, that puppy was not going green. And then he's like, forget that. I'm just going to cut it out and put a plotted garden there. I was like, sweet, dude. Looks good. Crisis averted. But he works at it every day. The other day I saw him walking his dog. I was walking the kids and he's like, oh, hey, I'm Jim. I'm like, oh, I know you, dude. You're the constant gardener. Got a lot of respect for you, man. Because, you know, if you came to my backyard right now, <laughs> you're going to see a lot of dead or dying things. His gardening is harsh. This is not dirt. This is clay. <laughs> oh, yes, honey. I do think it would be a good idea to get another fruit or vegetable garden for the kids. Let's give that a shot. Let's put $70 down and see how that goes. Dead in a week. It's all dead. And it's hard because why? It requires constant labor, toil, even the depletion. We give ourselves. Can we give ourselves over to this matting and watering of the gospel? We give our very souls to it. I'm willing to pour myself out. Paul will say in the last chapter of 2 Timothy, I poured my life out as a drink offering. It's, it's the dregs, he says. Like when there's a juice that still has the, you know, it's kind of gross. Like the ending bits of a juice or a wine. It's like the dregs. I poured it out my whole life. It's the picture of the constant gardener in faith. And if we had a question of, well, how does it really mean? At this point, when we arrive at the, okay, we got soldier, we got athlete, we got farmer. If we were still sitting there wondering, how does he mean it, though, really? What's the, the layered meaning? He's going to tell us. He just outright says it. Think about what I'm saying. Jesus will give you understanding, and this is it. When I say soldier, athlete, farmer, I mean through Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that's the gospel. That's what I suffer for and suffer with. And I endure all these things for the sake of the chosen people of God. He just gives the, the whole gospel in about four or five verses. That's the gospel in miniature. That Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. He is the Jewish Messiah. That's what that phrase, seed of David, the descendant of David, the seed of David. He's the Jewish, the chosen one of God of all history and all time. He's in prison. I'm in prison. That's why I suffer. But the gospel cannot be chained. It's here to set the captives free. And finally, I suffer, not by myself, not alone, but always with. I suffer with. Always with others. And for others. It's just the gospel that we are. Soldier, athlete, farmer. For the gospel, for the good news of Jesus. That other sinners, we might come alongside and suffer with them that they might be saved. And he ends with this poem that is just, man, this is like, um, what a script. Like, this is a great memory verse. This is a great one to wake up to every day. You have problems reminding yourself of the promises of God. Just tape this one, you know, across your dash or across your bathroom sink. This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, though, since he cannot deny himself. Some of us get really hung up on the one verse there about denying him. You know, that really puts the fear of God in us. Well, what, what, did I do that? And is that me? Is he talking about me? Probably not. That's how I'd answer for now. Probably not. This language is used in, in, in Timothy's and the Peter's and 1 John. The women's study is going through this 1 John study, and, and I'm reading it with the kids right now. And he uses very similar language to Apostle John. You know, if we deny him, he's going to deny us. Here, 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 when you read that, let me do you a favor, okay? And, and, and de-escalate 
your extremist thinking of, is that me? If I deny him once, am I out? He's talking about someone with a consistent, patterned, unrepentant sin. Okay? A, a consistent, patterned, unrepentant sinner. That's the reference there. Someone who has said, under maybe, maybe persecution or suffering, I deny Christ and I deny him thoroughly and fully. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul in, a, in an unrepentant, patterned way. Okay? So more than likely we fall in the last category, though, because we backslide and we have doubts and we do not have a faithful track record, do we? But take heart. Even when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. In the imagery, I, I, I gave this to you um, maybe a month back. We talked about Genesis 15. Go back and do a study of Genesis 15. It's a hinge point chapter in the whole Bible. And it talks about it, images. It shows this old Jewish ceremony when two parties come to make a covenant blood oath. And, and what God says in this picture, in this, this ritual dance, he says that I'm, even when you fail your side, Israel, and the, and the Gentiles who later become a part of Israel, even when you fail your side, I'm going to stay good on my side. I'm going to keep my side. When you're unfaithful, I remain faithful. And Paul is simply quoting that, isn't he? He uses the same imagery of a covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God. And even when you backslide or you mess up for the hundredth time, he remains faithful. Now, in a couple minutes, we're going to wind down and, and go to Q&A, but I want to give you one last image. For, for If we wake up in Babylon, if we wake up in, a, in warfare, then what tools might we have? I'm going to give you some words. Stuff you know, actually. Stuff you see every year. And I want to remind you that these are tools that anyone can use. They're not some mystical 17-point class or study or, or secret handshake on how to fight God's battles with him. You're going to see how straightforward they are. But I want to tell you how I got there. One of the things that really stood out to me in this, this war being waged even now in the Middle East was that moment, and maybe you read this in the news, that moment that, that um, Israel decided to call up 360,000 um, conscripts again. And I say again because they had once already served. If you know about Israel, they have mandatory conscription. So men and women, when they become of age, serve mandatory military service. These, these guys who are coming up now are men because it's combat roles only. And I was listening to this wonderful podcast from Biola University called Think Biblically. I recommend it to you. It's a great, if you want to go deeper in your study, Think Biblically, put on by some Biola people. They have this guy, Mitch Glazer, president of a nonprofit called Chosen People Ministries that works in Israel and Palestine with and for Christians. Um, you know, even Jewish Christians were culturally Jewish, but now they've you know, found Jesus, Messianic Jews. And um, he's been working there decades. The organization is as old as the 1890s. So that's a person I want to listen to, you know, maybe learn from on this complex issue. He talked about, just as a side note, this wasn't even the main theme of the podcast, but he just talked about these men leaving their jobs, leaving their wives, their children, their expectant mothers, their families friends, roommates, to head back out to the front lines. People like Nadav Padan, a guy I read about in some ABC article. He's a reserve general in the Israeli military. He currently lives in New York. Within hours, Padan decided to join the fight, this article says. It says before he could leave the next day, his teenage son had a few questions. I bet he did. What's going on in Israel, and why are you going there? Is it really important for you to fly over there? Are you going to be at risk? And it didn't include this here, but I'm sure a teenage boy who's watched anything on his phone even once understands the stakes. He might have added off camera. And will you be coming back? In response to those questions, he answered his son, I have a responsibility for the future of Israel and everyone that can help right now should be there, he says. I'm just going to stop right there and, and say this is not a military message. <laughs> this is not a political message. This is, it still isn't some choosing sides message. As you can see in a second, we, we, we are for and with and in the kingdom of God. It means we fight for that kingdom. All or nothing for that kingdom. All or nothing. 
But what I will say as I was listening to that is my introspection, my question applied to myself was, man, will I be ready the day the Lord calls me to help fight his battles? Just that picture of a separation of life, a life going one direction, unperturbed, and then a course correction, a dramatic and radical call to fight for the Lord's armies. Will I be ready when I get my call? And by the way, that call, just to spare the suspense, is here and now. It's every single day. It's not just some one day second coming of Jesus battle. It's every day here and now we wake up in warfare. Ephesians 6, 6, the same church, the same people in the Timothy letter that we're reading. Paul says that every day we fight forces in a heavenly realm, evil forces of a heavenly or spiritual realm. Every day we get that call. So for today, you guys, for later today, for Monday morning, for this seven-day period, I want to leave you with four images that you can bank on, that you can use to fight and live, not just survive, but thrive, even in a land of great warfare. And the first one is the word born. I want you to remember Jesus Christ born. I want you to remember Christmas Eve, okay? Revelation 12 says, so the woman gave birth to a son, that is Mary, a male child, that is Jesus, who's going to rule over the nations with an iron rod. Her child was suddenly caught up to God and to his throne, so that the huge, it continues in verse 9, so a huge dragon, the ancient serpent, the one called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, was thrown down. Everyone say, thrown down. He's thrown down to the earth and his angels along with him. Chapter 12 says, thrown down three times. Thrown down, thrown down, thrown down. When will this happen? And everyone just says, Christmas Eve. <laughs> That's what you say. On Christmas Eve. God, in the form of a baby, came to earth. And guys, there was a shift in the power structures of the universe. We celebrate that every year. It's not a special token of spirituality. It's not a spiritual dance. It's not a seminar. Guys, it's Christmas Eve. Every one of you has Christmas Eve inside you. A child born and the enemy, boom, thrown down. That power still exists today and continues today. Born, that's your first word. You can wrap onto that this week. Next word, kingdom. Everyone say kingdom. Kingdom. Jesus comes in Luke chapter 4. He gives his first sermon. Everyone wants to know, who are you and why have you come? He gets out the scroll of Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointing me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Who's that? The POWs. And the regaining of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed. He sits the scroll down. He sits himself down and says, this day has come to pass in your hearing. The kingdom is fearlessly advancing, forcefully advancing. And even now it continues with you and me. It's taking ground. It's taking ground. That's why I say when the world shakes and there's epidemic, and there's global warfare, and there's all these trial and circumstances. Are we on uneven ground? Are, are, we, are we shook? No. We stand on even ground, and the firm footing of the kingdom of God here and now advancing, not just in some intangible inward way, though it is inward too, but a tangible, natural way. Right now, in the world around you, the kingdom is fearlessly and falsely advancing. Everyone say kingdom. Kingdom, every one of you has that. You're part of that. You're in that. How about the death and resurrection of Jesus? John chapter 12. Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. He's been thrown down and driven out. And, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, meaning on the cross, I will draw all people to myself. Another cosmic shift. That all the evil and all the wickedness and all the power that the enemy had exercised up to even that point is broken by what? The most powerful symbol in the whole world. You see it every Sunday. Do you need special skills or a special class to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus? Guys, it's day one stuff. I mean, assuming you're a believer, if you're not, let's pray after service. But if you are, if you've even prayed one time, if you said, thank you, Jesus, I bend the knee, you are Lord and Savior, you have this tool inside you. Or overcome, overcoming what? Overcoming what? Death. That's, you got it. That's the answer. So do you, like some of my dear friends and family, struggle with anxiety? Do you struggle, struggle with worry? 
or fear about tomorrow, you know, do an exercise that I sometimes do with my friends and family. I'll just say, let's take that one thing that you're anxious about and let's take it to its worst possible end. Take it to its worst possible end. Where does it go? Inevitably, in a lot of these stories, maybe it's the same for you, what could be worse than death? Well, it's going to be, if I get sick like that or someone I love gets sick like that, well, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna die. And then for those who have the hope of Jesus, there is no death. What have we done but dismantle death, you guys? With the cross and the empty grave, we've dismantled death. Well, what play does he have? Well, what other play does he have? Only what we give him. Only, only the invitations that we give for him to take a hold of and try and give us some kind of oppression. But we have these words because Jesus was born. Everyone would say, born. And he's fearfully advancing the kingdom. Everyone would say, kingdom. And he died and resurrected. Everyone would say, died and resurrected. And one that we forget more than the rest. So it seems repeating is Ephesians 2, 6. It says, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He reigns. He reigns. The Bible says very clearly that when Jesus died and resurrected, he ascended and then he was enthroned. And then not only that, that would be a wonderful grace unto itself, but not only that, somehow in some stunning mystery, we reign with him. <laughs> when we suffer with him, we reign with him, like Johnson said. Now here's another challenge for you. If you worry, you have fear you're battling this very day, anxiety, depression, take that down to its ends. I want you to remember this question that you can ask yourself. Ask yourself out loud. Is he enthroned? Ask yourself, is he enthroned right now? Does he rule? Is he ruling? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. He rules. He reigns. Even now, he is ruling and reigning. Who's reigning? Jesus. Jesus is ruling and reigning even now. Whatever the enemy has whatever he still has from his playbook, whatever, whatever his tents and I invitations are, they are at the permission of Jesus Christ, who's ruling and reigning now, so that we may be tried and tested for our own proving. Whatever he has is permitted by him who reigns. Look, he's going to come up uh, in a minute. I think he might be preaching in MEC, but... Um, I want to do some Q&A, and, &A and um, I'll just give you one last image, and uh, I'll handle questions until Bucky gets here. But, uh, you know, I was at this conference two weeks ago, and, and they, this group, Alpha, which is a great group for, if you're looking for a Bible study to do, um, Alpha is a, one of the masters at God conversations, how to do table fellowship, how to do a roundtable discussion about the things of faith for real non-believers don't have a church, but are super curious. They, they've established this, and they did this, this monumental research study around Gen Z, which is those aged 13 to 27. And one of the things they found out is, what's one of the biggest barriers to faith? And the answer was, um, it doesn't appear that Jesus is reigning. In fact, it doesn't even appear that he's around at all. And, and by the way, that's not just a Gen Z problem, is it? <laughs> For all of us and different ages and stages of life have wondered the same thing. Is he reigning? Not only is he reigning, but is he even around at all? In this world, I mean, right? When you look around and you see the news and the headlines and, and you're assaulted every day, your senses are assaulted every day with this apparent lack of presence. And it's in those moments, you guys, where we have to go back to Daryl Johnson quoting, looking at Revelation, and we say, things are not as they seem. And these are the practical points that I give you that I want to leave you with this morning. If we wake up in warfare, if every day is warfare, there are two, two things that we can continue to do. The tools that we have are all those words that he's born, that the kingdom is advancing, that he died and rose again, and that he's enthroned, that he's seated and enthroned in heavenly places. Those are all tools you can have. But we have to wage that war in our hearts and minds, you guys. When our senses are overloaded and inundated with the things of this world, every single day, sometimes 10 hours a day, we have to... Wash our brains with the word of God, the gospel. That's what I just sought to do with those four points. Yeah, you get up here, Bucky. I need your help, man. And so those are two practical tools and things I would have you just consider and, and, and pray through this week. Um, if you're feeling challenged, if you're feeling soft, if you're feeling like you're in a crisis because of the things that are going on in the world around you today, 
Remember those words that jump off the screen. They're the gospel, that's all they are. They're really just the full gospel. And uh, remember that when you feel off kilter, um, these are two things. One of them is our charge. We still get to do that, to set captives free, mind, body, and soul. And um, we also need to remember that the word of God is great at conditioning, reconditioning our minds. Question up front. And you can use the website um, that will be up there if you want to send a question anonymously. For now, go, go ahead, please, Jenna. Okay. I was wondering if we could speak a little more into suffering. What does it mean to actually suffer well? Because I think as Christians, it's like, it feels overwhelming. Like, I want to run away and avoid. Like, is there a way to avoid suffering for, for Christ? How, how do I do, how do you do it well? Mm. Great question, Jenna. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I think... Uh, as somebody said, when you do what Jesus did, you get what Jesus got. And it seems it's inevitable when you love Jesus, there are people, it's going to become evident to people around you, whether that's in your family, it's going to be evident to people in the workplace, it's going to be evident to maybe your culture, and as a result, there's going to be pushback. That might be emotional, physical, could be spiritual, you know, just from the warfare of what it means to live for Christ. And so suffering is a part of this gig, and I don't think um, we can really avoid it. It's going to come some way or another. Um, how do you suffer well? I think suffering well uh, involves um, getting uh, a lot or having community in your life. I think uh, suffering alone is really hard without community. So having people that are like-minded that will support you and encourage you in your suffering has been a huge part of when I've had to suffer. And um, I'm not talking about specifically just for preaching Christ, but just when trials and struggles have come into my life, having people that are like-minded praying for me, that's been huge. So community is a huge part for suffer of suffering well. Yeah, I agree. The, the words that are jumping to mind is lament, healthy lament. So again, don't mistake this teaching series as some macho thing. We don't cry. Or we are entirely broken. Go on. Go on and be broken and weep. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what Bucky's doing is linking them. And, and, I, and I think both are fruitful. I'd, I'd at least just continue that if that's your question. I, I'd link it and say whether you had a, because Bucky's had, he talked about last weekend, six some odd surgeries. You know, he's had personal bodily suffering in his mind, body, and soul. And, and those are effective for producing fruit. Those are, those are, those are the scripture says, those are, those are productive for like this immovable metal, these metals that can't be, you know, broken. And so um, I think both are worthwhile and worthy. Some, some could be maybe needless for someone that doesn't have healthy boundaries or allows themselves to be, you know, abused or engaged in some patterned thing that, you know, um, like that. But, it, but even that, by the way, like could produce fruit. That's the crazy thing if you maintain that position. So I think lament yeah. is good, community is good. Just to the question of how, because I think that's a really good question, Jenna. Someone might be thinking, well, how do we do that well? Uh, lament and community yeah. are two big ones. Yeah, and I think, I think also the perspective of uh, if we're suffering in this world because it's disease or sickness or normal stuff, not, not particularly because we've shared the gospel and somebody persecuted us, that suffering is an opportunity of the gospel, right? So when people watch you suffer with hope, even though the world's crashing in upon you, you've lost your job, you have cancer, and you suffer with hope, and you suffer, and you realize that suffering, there's something redeemable there, and you realize you're not alone, but God is with you in that suffering, people see that. Nurses see that. Doctors see that. It's a witness for the gospel. Right. And so that's a part of suffering in a sense when you choose to make it that way, that's suffering with Christ with you. That's gospel suffering. Yeah. You know? Thanks, Jenna. Great question. This question says, how do you teach or model everyday suffering to raising children? So there's, as with all of these questions, there's a great physical, emotional, and spiritual component. Um, when mom and dad are having a conflict, and we learn this from these, we learn that from these old timers, that it's okay to, to fight fair in front of your kids. It's kind of an interesting idea, isn't it? It assumes you can fight fair, <laughs> by the way, um, you know, because they're going to caught, they're going to catch that watching you deliberate and, and watching you have your conflict out in front of them. Um, but you know, that's emotional grit. That that's relational grit. That's conversational grit to be able to say, okay, we're not going to hide this or dress this up or or put it over here. We're going to we're going to have this out and we're going to come to resolution or not and still have peace, peaceable fighting fairness. 
there's an emotional one. I'll just give it a physical one and pass it to you, Bucky. Um, a lot with kids in the physical space is like, we don't give them everything they want. We don't give them everything they want. I mean, what, what better way to try and stemmy the, the consumeristic tide of where we're all, you know, kind of living today if it were for just saying, hey, we're going to place limits. And by the way, that's not just some secular idea. We're not giving them everything they want. God gives us limits. That's called loving discipline. When you put limits over your children, God does the same thing for us. We can't do everything. We can't be God. And so that works across the board, but there's intentional things. This is a trip to Mexico this last Sunday. We would have gone, but we had a child care issue. Take them out of the bubble and let them just see, let them see, taste, touch, and feel yeah. people that have it differently. Homelessness in Costa Mesa, we do that every month. Right. And choices and consequences. Um, you know, there's this whole idea that was part of my upbringing and parenting is like there's these helicopter parents that come in and rescue their kids every time. I had par- we had friends that did their kids' homework for them so they didn't get bad grades, made, made, fill out their applications to college so they got the right college. It's like we're rescuing them from any real-world stuff. So choices and consequences, give your kids choices and give them healthy, safe consequences so they can learn that everything doesn't always work out well in life. Even sometimes our decisions provide the suffering because we've chosen it, you know? Yeah. And so that's a great way to teach them. Yeah, we call suffering. those yeah. natural consequences. That's yeah. a great everyday example. There's a question somewhere in person? Go ahead. Hey, guys. How's it going? Hey, Jen. Hey, uh, can you qualify or, like, kind of give us an idea about, like, what does war or battle look like in what you're, you're talking about, this whole, like, spiritual battle, spiritual war? What does war look like in the context of of Ephesians 6? Yeah, yeah, or yeah, in the context of your teaching today, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I I would just reiterate really briefly what what I what I've said, which is Paul says that we have this unseen battle in the spiritual realm of evil, evil forces contending. And then we take that alongside this understanding that there is the prince of the air, that is Satan, who's like I said a second ago, been given some delegated authority. Again, but even that acknowledges the ruler. And, and, and why would he do that? Why would God you know, be in cahoots with the devil if it weren't for some redemptive end, which is what we're talking about in this series, is suffering or persecution are hard things. And so if you have that paradigm and you have the enemy still as an active agent in this natural world, um, that's the picture of warfare. And so um, I've given some examples in the message about fear, worry, anxiety, depression. Some of those are natural biological genetic things. Some of those are spiritual things. What we believe at this church about the body is that it's an integrated whole. So mind, body, and soul. Those are the quote-unquote psychosomatic. That just means when you have a mind thing, maybe you've experienced this. Have you ever had such a mental or emotional season that plagued you so hard you had a physical outgrowth of that mental or emotional issue? Of course. Even to the, to the extent of, man, I have acid reflux, or I'm gritting my teeth, and I have this pain in my side, or I have sleepless nights. Well, what are your body is telling you there's physical consequences for the emotional, spiritual dynamic of who you are. That's a, that's a proof right there for the fact that we have souls. And so that gets waged, and, and we try to give you some tools. The Word of God, community, prayer, intercession, those are, those are tangible tools in this natural world to fight. Yeah, I like what helps me make sense of it is to say, where, where's the battle fought? And the Bible talks about three battlegrounds, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are the three places we fight this battle. Um, we fight it against uh, deceptive ideas. Satan is using deceptive ideas, false ideas, false ideologies, right? The, the lies, right? Deceptive ideas to play on our disordered desires. Our flesh is about disordered desires. We put ourself above God. It's disordered. The gospel reorders it, but his lies play on disordered I, I, uh, desires in a world that affirms destructive life. So the world affirms sin. The world affirms this. So we're fighting the battlegrounds in those three, three areas. And so that helps me make sense of it. Good. World, flesh, and the devil. We're up to the top of the clock here. The worship team's going to come up, but um, yeah, th- there's just a really quick one that we can do fast. Someone said, I have a family member coming from the Catholic Church, and they're coming to visit, which would be a good Sunday. The, the answer is any Sunday would be really good. Coming into the holiday season, um, that's a great time. To, people are ready to say yes to your holiday requests for church, so please consider that. Uh, we'll do Q&A again, even in you know this next um, month, so um, get excited for that. Thank you so much, guys, for your questions. We, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all Great of them. Questions. Thanks, Bucky. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we'll do a... What's so cool is I was over there, 
in our Spanish-speaking sanctuary preaching to those folks over there. They are on fire. You guys got to meet those guys and get to know that church community over there. That's our church community. We're one church, two voices, but a great community of people that spills out of the patio. It's so fun what God's doing in our church. Thanks, Bucky. Awesome. Thank you. We'll, we'll do a podcast to address a couple more of those questions you might have had. It's not too late. Fire, send them in, please. Use that link and send them in. and We'll do a follow-up conversation um, just to encourage you and equip you. For now, let's stand and receive communion. Jesus, thank you so much, God, for the grace of your word. It's powerful and effective even now, even in this world. It never fails, Lord God. Thank you so much for the sacraments of your body and your blood that we can receive this grace. God, I just pray that it would renew and encourage us until you come again. We love you, Lord. We renew our vows with you now. In Jesus' name, amen. When you're ready, you can go to the tables in the back or the front uh, and break bread.